so I, so I was worried before this guy got into government and then he got into government. I'm like, man, I, I hope he's not competent, right? Sometimes you prefer an incompetent, dumb ass, excuse my language, th than a competent one because they can do nothing. They can accomplish nothing. They just sit around clowning. This guy making changes, right? From Nomad Capitalist Live in Mexico City, I'm Andrew Henderson, sitting down today with the founder of Wall Street Bets, Mr. Jamie Rogozinski. Great to be with you. Thank you very much for having me. And I wanted to talk first, because we are here in Mexico City. You live in Mexico City. You know? One thing I don't hear is we talk about citizenship, we talk about living overseas, a lot of Americans now moving to Mexico. I'm curious about your story. You moved to Mexico City, and my understanding that you were actually born with dual citizenship. That's correct. So I was born in Mexico and I lived here until my preteens, until I was 12. Then I lived the rest of my adult life in the U.S. So I went to high school and college and started my career there. And then I moved back to Mexico, what seems like yesterday, but was actually eight years ago. Uh, so I was born with two citizenships. My dad is Mexican by nationality and my mom is American also by nationality. Uh, hence, I'm also bilingual. I can speak both English and Spanish. Native. So you're natively bilingual. You That's were born correct. in Mexico, so by virtue of simply being born in Mexico, you're Mexican and then your mother made sure you got American citizenship as well. That's correct, what as do my kids. And you have kids and then they're both. Correct. You have originally said Polish ancestry after the war, but people lived in France. Tell us about that, because that, those are harder citizenships to keep. Yeah, citizenship is a, it's an interesting thing, especially in my family. So my dad, I said he's national, his nationality is Mexican, but he was actually born in France, and his parents were from Poland. Uh, and after the Second World War, they decided to leave uh, Europe. And as they're working their way over, finding a place to go, they stopped by France and then... Uh, my dad was born there, and in France, you can only get your nationality, at least at the time, I, probably the rules are slightly different now, but through blood, meaning right. your parents. Same thing. So, uh, so he did not have a nationality. He had to have been born in Poland, and he didn't have any interest in going back there, so he came to Mexico without any citizenship, and he was a refugee of the UN until he was like 30 Mid 30s, uh, and so forever, he would, you know, he studied in the US with the refugee passport wow. for the UN. Wow. And so your experience, um, do you feel like you grew up with more of a Mexican culture, more of a European culture, more of your mother's American? Like for people who were saying, if I move, my kids aren't going to know what's going on. I mean, talk about how you felt. It's interesting. because So I moved to the U.S. when I'm very moldable still, right? And I was 12 years old. My sister was, what, two years older than me, so she was already in high school, maybe she might have been older. And then my, my brother was three years younger than me. So we had, between the three of us, a little bit of that range. When you ask how I identify myself, my creation, my personality, my experiences, really start when I start becoming a teenager. I start going out, I start learning about life, getting in trouble, whatever it might be. In Mexico, uh, when I lived here, I'm still very guarded and I'm uh, doing whatever my parents decide to do that day, right? No, not very much independent. So my uh, cultural identity was formed in the U.S. Uh, you know, I, the, the language remained with me for Mexico. My taste for food and like oh. spicy and things like that. Then when I came back here, I uh, I definitely felt like I was in a different place, right? You can just I don't know the, the moment you get to the airport and things just flow at a different speed, a different vibe. And it's interesting because people would ask me, why did you move to Mexico? Or you, did your visa run out? Like, what, you know, you lived in the US before, what's your problem? So, so I said, well, what's the problem? You know, this is, there's nothing wrong with this place. He goes, well, there's traffic, there's corruption, <laughs> traffic. there's crime. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you don't think there's corruption, crime no, of and traffic not. in the US? It only costs a billion dollars to be elected president. <laughs> Go to Chicago, exactly. Right, so, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> every country's gonna have its thing, right? And uh, what I love about Mexico is the people are so warm. I instantly made a ton of friendships. The people that I knew when I was like super young reached out to me because they saw on Facebook yeah. or whatever. And I'm instantly embraced into the culture, and it's just so welcoming that I, prior to moving to Mexico, I'd bounced around the U.S. like a vagabond, 
And when I got here, it was going to be a pit stop. But now I got married here. And I have kids. Like, I have no intention of leaving here. I'm super happy. You're planning on staying in Mexico. I have no intention on leaving Mexico. It's yeah. a different thing. Do, do they treat you pretty? I mean, the people treat you well from a government perspective. I would imagine like anyone who moves overseas for a long period of time and comes back, there's been no gaps there, right? Yeah, it's, it's, in, my, in my family, it's a little bit trickier because my dad's like a politician and he got involved with, with politics and that's always uh, puts a slightly different twist on how I'm treated or how the behavior or how people react to, to me when they find out uh, who I am. But that's since withered away since I got here because uh, uh, it's no longer relevant. But when I get here, you just learn the new rules of the game, right? I, you know, you, you get stopped by a cop and... If they're dirty, they try to get something out of you. But there's like established rules that you work with, right? And I had this conversation a couple of weeks ago where a, a Mexican, native Mexican said, I'm petrified in the US if I get stopped by the cops. And I said, why? And it's like, because they're just, you know, they're organized, they're structured, they have their radio, you can call the gun, you see the videos. And I go, yes, but they follow the law. Surely you'll find examples where that's not the case. And of course, we're aware of the high profile ones. But for the most part, the police officers have a law to follow. And, and the justice system is such that they prefer to let an innocent person go free, right? Than, than to put in jail in the US. In the US, correct, right? So you don't have anything to worry about. Why did the cop pull you over? If you did something wrong, he'll give you a ticket and call it a day. If you do something stupid, then, then, you, <laughs> then you're asking for it. I, on the other hand, am, am more worried, at least le less comfortable when I get stopped by a cop in Mexico because I'm not as natively familiar with the rules of the game. I know they're flexible. I know you can talk your way out of things. I know you can name drop or bribe or whatever. <laughs> but I just, it's out of my element. And so I, I, uh, I, it, I get more nervous with a Mexican cop. Do you really? I do because I don't know how to handle the situation. In the US, you just do what you're told and you go along We've your We've had day. a lot of folks, like you said, the native Mexican or we had African-Americans who go to Colombia, for example, and they say to the cops there, I just, I look like a normal, person and they feel more comfortable in the Mexico's, the Colombia's. You're saying it's for you no, the no, opposite. No, no, it's, it's when I'm having an interaction with the police, right? Because I don't understand what the rules of the game are, right? If I try to pull out a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill in the U.S., I know what's going to happen to me, right? Uh, I know that in Mexico, if I have a crooked cop, right? In the U.S., if I have a crooked cop, I know the justice system's got my back, right? Start recording it and then eventually the judge has it. Here in Mexico, I don't know exactly if I should be pals with them or try to like protect my innocence and start filming and piss them off. Like, I, it's just that that dynamic. On the other hand, people are not afraid of the cops here, the people that are natively from here that do know how to handle those situations because the cops at the end of the day don't have as much, because of that wiggle room, <laughs> people that are confident know how to work their way out of it can talk their way out of a ticket. I'll just give you a really small case. During the pandemic, there was rules about who can drive and not drive, and I'm driving my wife's, no, I'm driving my car, uh, to take my kids somewhere, and I get pulled over by a cop because I wasn't allowed to drive, right? I forget what the details are. And the cop says, I'm taking your car to the impound, and blah, blah, blah. So I call my wife, and I'm like, you know, hey, this cop, what do I do? Do I try to get out? I need my car. She's Mexican. She's Mexican. She's like, give him the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I give him the phone, and he goes, logs in it. And by the time he gives me the phone back, he goes, yes, ma'am. I understood, ma'am. Yes, I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> gives me the phone, says, you're, you're welcome to go about your merry way. And I'm like, no bribe? Like, what? And then I call my wife, like, how much do I owe him? And you know, she's like, just leave. I don't know what she told him, <laughs> right? But she knows how to do that. I don't. So, um it's obviously something that can be learned, and it's not important enough for me to take the time. Do, do you think, I mean, again, you, you grew up here, so that's your reason. Do you think that coming back there was some prescience in predicting this kind of decline in the United States and the fact that more people would be coming to Mexico? Because we were talking about maybe people should not go to Canada if Trump wins, but they should go to Mexico six years ago. I, you know, I don't know enough about the specifics around that, but I have seen attention be brought to that subject uh, from the press, from even financial press, like what should expats be doing? Or, you know, like the fact that the cost of living is so less. Uh, you know, it's, it's because I live in Mexico, now my vantage point is split. I spend half the time I travel and I work in the US, my family, my friends are all there. So I get to see things through the lens of the US, but, but then I come home to my lens of Mexico. And so I got, it's, it's impossible for me to say it's the US, how is it doing relative to nothing? Right? Or I can say, how's the U.S. doing relative to the other place where you live? And so as a whole, you know, the U.S. kind of pulls Mexico you know, up or down alongside with it. And I think the whole world as a whole has taken a bit of a hit. So relatively speaking, I can't say which country has been made better or worse. But I know that the U.S. has a ton of issues with 
uh, inflation, which you're not over with, right? Like something that I found really interesting when they start printing money during the uh, pandemic. Everyone was like, well, that's, you know, they start making the memes about Jerome Powell making the printer go burr. Uh, and everybody, even an economist that's like in fifth grade understands supply and demand and they're increasing supply of dollars. And so it's not a complicated subject. Everyone starts joking about it, but nobody realizes it's actually happening, right? The price of the dollar doesn't move instantly. These, these uh, financial markets that are supposed to be forward looking apparently forgot the forward part of it, right? And they don't realize that eventually those dollars are gonna hit supply and the circulation. And, and so that's going to have an effect. And so next thing that happens is two years later, once it starts kicking in, the, the inflation starts going up and the interest rate is not the other. And the world's like, why is there inflation? It's like, um, we saw that coming, right? So because with that same logic, they're not done, right? Like there's still, there's still a lot of things to, fi to, to uh, fix and I don't envy the job of uh, the central bank and the government, the treasury, the people that are trying to balance this equation of usually it's been the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. Those are like the two things that the central bank's supposed to focus on. But the levers don't work in the same directions anymore because of whatever reason, maybe the way that employment rate is reported, uh, maybe people taking multiple jobs and only report, like who knows what's taking place, but they can't use the same arsenal they used to. Uh, and when it comes to Mexico, we'll see what happens, right? Um, you know, it's like I said, there's a, a, an aftershock that does kind of make it here. But because the cost of living is so much less, I can handle 100% inflation right. and still be it just as good as I was in the U.S. Anything less than 100% inflation, I'm making a lot of money. Right? That's the number. Uh, for, it's, it, that's the number. That's correct. Um, I can tell you how I got there. But it's sheer observation. You can't just use the currency exchange rate, you have to use the acquisition power. So you can convert how much a dollar is in pesos, but that dollar can buy you a lot more stuff or services than it can here, than it can there, right? And things cost on average half as much. And, and uh, uh, it's always been the case. If something happens to the Mexican peso, there's no way that it can get stronger uh, it can get, you know, it, it can get stronger, I guess, if the dollar goes down, but eventually it's going to weaken down. If the peso gets weaker, then I'm even better off because I get paid in dollars. Right. Oh, we'll come back to Mexico more, but you mentioned uh, the economy. Looking forward to 2023, are there three predictions that you would say for the year ahead? Uh, Globally, U.S. or Mexico? For all the above. Um, so, you say, yeah, so you have the global average and then the subsets where you have the U.S. being the powerhouse that's kind of leading the charge and everybody else either tries to follow, follows, or does it without uh, consent, meaning like they just, because the, the dollar is still the currency around the world, uh, oil prices is still really tied to that, and, uh, uh, and then Mexico, specifically the trade relationships and the fact that the U.S. is, is tussling with China, you, you have a lot of Mexicans that are trying to take advantage of that posture and saying, hey, look, we're right over here, we're the same time zone, we can just ship it to you right away. Uh, and, and I know personally of many different people that have switched their, their uh, suppliers from China to Mexico. So, uh, but because of that, you still have this tangential thing. So 2023, what do I predict? I pr uh, inflation continues to go up. Uh, I predict that we're going to have a, it's, when it comes to the, to the financial markets, the equities specifically, like stock markets, I'm predicting some just sideways chop of indecision, something that we haven't seen probably since uh, maybe you know the, the financial crisis or perhaps even before then. Uh, so uh, then I would uh, I would probably predict a lot of political uncertainty, um, but, but that's that's happening around the world. Even even the po political structures uh, are being copied in other countries. We saw it in France, we, see it, we saw it in Mexico, we saw it in, um, what was it, in Bolivia, we see it in a bunch of other different countries. What do you think about politics in Mexico? People say, oh, look at AMLO, or now they're saying in Colombia, look at Petro. Well, we don't have enough time. <laughs> um, what do I think about, look, I am worried, and I was worried since before the latest president. Mexico has a six-year term for a presidency, and then no re-election, so as opposed to two four-year terms max. Is that a better system, by the way, that people don't have to theoretically I seek made, popularity? I haven't made up my mind, right? So like the two extremes of that is if you look at Senate and, and, and the House of Representatives, that they get two years and six years, right? And say which one's better because the, 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 the ones that have the shorter term constantly campaign. Always going. Right? 
And then the ones that are six years, and then the senators, they have a little bit more of like uh, the incumbency is much more relevant, right? And it's, there's, a, there's less motion. Uh, so I kind of use that as an example. The ones that are shorter term, it's good to flush the system. The ones that are longer term are okay, but it's harder to, to change. So in Mexico specifically, the, the, although they have that same tiered system where, where the legislatures and the governors, which by the way work a lot closer than with the federal government they do in, in the US, uh, you, you, they're staggered. But when you have this new president that comes in, there's usually a complete sweep of the, uh, you know, the, the two uh, branches. It's the same, same structure of government. And then the justice system, yeah, they do the same little maneuvering to, to replace the judges. But when they first get in the power, they can pass all the laws and get a lot of things done. Before this president got elected, he was a worrisome president. He was a populist and he kind of doesn't make up his mind. He made a, really, a ton of really bad decisions and a lot of really scary decisions. And he, and he, uh, if, he was very effective with, uh, with making those changes, not implementing them, but changing them. So he canceled this massive airport project that, that uh, was a very, very good project for the economy. They did uh, the, the structural reform for the energy, which spooked any remaining investor that remained after they, they uh, pulled all these things off. They're kind of militarizing the police system. like the, the, so I, so I was worried before this guy got into government, and then he got into government, I'm like, man, I, I hope he's not competent, right? Sometimes you prefer an incompetent, dumbass, excuse my language, th than a competent one, because they can do nothing, they can accomplish nothing, they just sit around clowning, this guy making changes, right? Uh, but I'm still here, right? I have the option to leave whenever I want, so clearly I haven't felt enough of those changes, I can't felt things that would have happened if we had the airport, if we had these uh, reforms, if we had the investors that didn't go away, I know that basically I feel the same as, as before he was there. So I'm watching. The other thing about Mexico is because every six years everyone comes in with the full sweep, it's like the, it's just a cycle where everything restarts, including the business, because businesses work really close with government as well. And so it just feels like towards the end of any presidency, like the whole country stops really accomplishing anything, waiting for the new guy to come in. Or grow. And then in the U.S., it's, you know, it's politics. I, every time that I say I've seen enough of craziness, like, it gets worse. So now I've, now I've come to the accept, I've accepted the fact that politics will continue to surprise me. And, uh, and, and so it, as that being the baseline of it's always going to be just more problematic, more division, more... Uh, by, you know, partisanship, more the politicalization of anything. Like we had an earthquake last night right here. And if I, I can't help but think that if we were in the U.S. and we had the earthquake in the U.S. and I went to Twitter to check on the news, I would see news uh, being uh, curated by politics, it would have been like, well, had it been this president, right. the, the people would have come in for here. Biden. And then, you know, like... Dude, there's an earthquake and the house fell. Can you not think of who the president is for now? Like, there's death people. Go help. This is the moment, right? Is like, it less political in Mexico, you think? In that when there's an earthquake, yeah. <laughs> Look, Mexico's extremely patriotic. I was in the U.S. during September 11th, and that was the most patriotic sure. I've ever seen the country, right? Everyone holding hands, everyone waving flags, everybody passing, even government passing laws. Like, everyone understood that, hey, we fight. Yeah, we have different ideas. But when it comes to, like, being attacked, we're definitely wearing the same colors, right? Um, that was that was cool, right? It was it was a special thing. Mexico doesn't need September 11th to feel that way. Um, they'll be able to set politics aside. We just had the Independence Day uh, last week, and big big parades down the. That's correct. The yeah, and they have they have a whole thing where the the president gets up and he says these things, and they you know they, and even even my wife that doesn't like or despises the current president. She's like, let's put on the TV to see, to watch him speak, right? She can put that aside for a half an hour to say, this is our country, let's sing this song. And, and I don't see that. I do see that in the US, right? Every, Fourth of July is gonna go and have their, you know, like cook out barbecue, whatever, however they like to celebrate, but they'll, they'll still be in there. Even, even it still feels part of You see Biden publics are like, oh, a, a, a barbecue feast is 18 cents less than last year. Like don't, Vote for those Republicans. We're doing a great job. Yeah. Why? Why would? Why would he? Why, why would anyone want to politicize 
the president, you know, the, the, the Independence Day. That, that is just adding to the division, right? Like, don't today, don't bring up that you're doing better than the other guy or whatever. Like, today, let's just hold hands and say, hey, 1776, this is the reason why, you know, what, these are the fundamental things that bring us together. And then tomorrow they can fight, right? Like, they, they can go back to normal. And so, slightly more patriotic uh, here in Mexico. It still goes back to divisions the moment that that instance or moment ends. Obviously, national tragedies or other, other you know, like uh, so, uh, sporting events, right? Like, you know, football, soccer, uh, is a big thing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's my observation. Is there a trick? Because we would tell people, if you're an American and you move to Mexico, or a Canadian moving to Mexico, you can perhaps somewhat float above the system. Maybe you don't have a car, maybe you live in a neighborhood, you just, you know, you're getting around an Uber. Maybe you don't have to really get involved in the politics to the extent that you have with your family. Yeah, you don't have to. You can get away. And that's always, you know, I, there was a moment in time where I cared a lot about politics, right? We're right. going to war in Iraq. We're doing this thing like, I, I'm young, I'm, this matters, my vote. And then, then Obama comes around, I'm like, Obama, you know, this guy kind of seems like he's genuine, he's different from the other stuff, like, let's give him a shot, and give him a shot, and, and then he's like, not doing anything, and doing it. And then he starts doing things that actually are gonna affect what I, what I care about, things that I will feel if I don't turn on the news, such as some of the laws regarding like net neutrality and stuff. And so I'm getting really pissed off, and I'm like, you know what, this sucks. I don't care about politics anymore, the president can do their thing, I'm less happy because I'm, involved in it, there's nothing that I can do. And so I basically became apathetic towards uh, politics at that point and, and became more of a spectator, which, which is not, the, I'm not proud of that, right? There's obviously something very wrong with, with that approach of saying, look, I give up. But, um, maybe not. Or maybe not, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I'm certainly happier, but I did take some, and then I've since gone back uh, towards uh, what I used to be like when I was younger, but I started, I adopted a philosophy, which is if I can't feel it, it doesn't affect me personally, I'm not gonna get mad about it. For example, I'm not going to ever take a position on abortion because I don't intend on having an abortion anytime soon. My wife is welcome to speak on that. We're welcome to talk about our opinions on that. And then she, her, her opinion on that outweighs mine by infinite fold, right? I live in Mexico and I don't intend on possessing guns in the US. So, meaning because I live here, not... And, and I wouldn't have a place to store them if I was in the U.S. And so because it won't affect me, I no longer get angry if they're making gun rules. Now, I can see how people could come up with arguments as to why it should still matter to me. But it doesn't because it doesn't affect me still. If I move back to the U.S., then I'll cure again, right? Because then it's a choice that will affect me. In the U.S., it's more about local governments. If I call 911, I want the police to get there and the firemen to get there. If I go to the hospital, I want them to take care of me. If I, you know, the roads should be patched up. That matters to me, and so, and so that's a really good way to live my life. The president, I can have my opinions, blah, blah, but I don't get involved unless I feel it. Here in Mexico, you do not need to feel it. I, I turn off politics uh, for six months at a time. I have no idea what's taking place. I don't feel anything, and then I'll turn politics back on, and I'll be like, Jesus, look at all these things that happened. I can't believe, <laughs> and then I get into it. Like, did you know that this guy did that, and then they put the other guy in jail? This is insane, and then I get super sucked into it. It's like a like a soap opera, right? And then I start feeling, I'm predicting how it's going to affect me in the future and this and that and the other, right? And then, then I get distracted again and I go back to not knowing anything and never getting affected by any of those changes. So, so I know from experience you can easily just turn it off and you just live about your merry day. Would you say in this apathy, did you leave because of Obama? Would you have left? I mean, there's, certainly there's Obama, there's the, in Mexico, the Trump phenomenon. I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to to allow something like that to dictate my life, right? Like, uh, I, I like to exert control over the things that I can control, and that is where I choose to live and how happy I choose to be. And it won't be decided by some leader that is in power that I may or may not like, um, because that, that it's just not, it's against my philosophy. It's certainly a contributing factor, right? When I'm when I'm trying to consider whether to leave a certain place or whether I want to go to a certain place. That's why earlier when you asked me if I plan on staying here, I said I don't plan on leaving, right? I don't have intention on leaving. Uh, it doesn't, meaning I'm not looking for other places to leave. What is the trigger though? It's possible that something pushes me out. What right? would that be? Uh, if I feel it, I have a family, I have kids, I have a happy life. I, uh, my kids are in school, we have, uh, we're safe. We, you know, we're able to get all of our, 
uh, utilities, our power work, like all you know, the, our basic lifestyle. We have all our basic, you know, on the, on the hierarchy of what was it, the Maslow's hierarchy, right? Like we're pretty high up on that chain. If we start getting knocked down on that, like security, and my wife knows this very well, if things become insecure to the point where uh, uh, where we don't feel safe, because that's sometimes all you need to do is not feel safe to not be happy, then that would push me out. I haven't had that be the case yet. Uh, you know, if I were to live in the US, I don't worry about security, but uh, I would worry about the economy. So if I were there in some crazy depression or, uh, you know, some, some, some financial crisis or unemployment goes through, whatever it might be, and I cannot feed my family, then that's a problem Then I'm going to look for a better place. Uh, but you do feel safe in Mexico. I do feel perfectly safe in People Mexico. People are decreasingly feel sa feeling safe in the United States, I think. I mean, that's, I, I can see why that is, um, but because I don't live there, I lived in Chicago, D.C., Salt Lake City, San Jose, California, Boston, and uh, uh, this was during from 95 ish to like 2015 ish. And I never felt on the say South Side Chicago, sometimes you took the wrong turn. DC, when I first moved there, you could definitely end up in some bad spots. By the time I left, it was nice. I don't, I haven't lived there uh, recently. I visited, and so I don't have a personal opinion. But if they feel unsafe, then that is problematic for sure. Let's talk about Wall Street bets. Uh, Give us a, an understanding of what made you found that and, and what's been the progression of Wall Street bets since. Certainly in the news a lot in the last year or two. So Wall Street bets, I'm, I'm uh, you know, single, I'm 30s. This is, uh, you know, I lost my job to the financial crisis directly. Yeah, the company went bankrupt and I was left unemployed looking for, for money and uh, getting a job here and there and having to travel uh, around the country for like a month job in here. And then and eventually I got a, a good job, uh, a very good job that was paying me very well it, back in Washington, D.C. at a bank. Of at all a bank, places. yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and, I'm, and I'm, because I'm single and I'm making very good money, I'm like, all right, I'm going to not go through that again. I'm going to save money and I'm also going to figure out a way to, uh, to grow my wealth so that I don't have, my, my well-being does not depend on some other entity or or the behavior of other entities or, or governments. And so I uh, walked past the Occupy Wall Street movement every day from the Metro, right? And so I had this Wall Street idea in my head and Wall Street, Wall Street, and they're the ones that did it. And then these, these uh, CEOs ended up getting rich and these things. I'm like, well, wait a second, there's no law that doesn't allow me to do it. I'm gonna learn how to get rich quick and I'm gonna not do it professionally. I'm gonna continue at my job, but on the side, I'm gonna figure and it out. That was one of the things that, I, that I've seen is the idea was how to get rich quick. Not not try to like steady dividend investing. I wasn't growing an nest egg, right? right? Like I had that too. You know, the job provided my 401k or Roth IRA matching and the whole thing. So I had my responsible. So that was set aside. That was set aside, but but I don't have anything to spend my money on. I don't need things. I've never really been much of a person that that uh, wants like a super fancy sports car. So I'm like, I'm going to take this extra money that I have after my savings, and I'm going to gamble with it, right? But because I knew even then that the only way to get rich quick is if you gamble. Literally, you can go to the casino, you can hit the jackpot and you get rich quick. You can buy a lottery ticket, you get rich quick. The risk is really high in that the probability that you that you win or the prob is low and the probability that you lose is very high and the amount that you lose is likely to be 100% of whatever you put in, right? So I said, let's do this here. Let's call this place Wall Street Bets so that I can attract people that are like-minded, that are looking to get rich quick, that want to uh, trade with the same knowledge background and same goals in mind. They don't wanna be professionals, meaning like actual day traders. It's a craft and it's a difficult one and it's a profession. And then you have investors, which is its own craft and it's more serious and it's longer term. I wanted it in the middle as I would keep my job and I wanna play like a game, but I'm still angry every day as I'm walking past Occupy Wall Street and I'm, when I named this place Wall Street Bets, I'm like, let's make a change in Wall Street. And I can complain, I can go vote, I can do these things, or I can play their game. If you can't beat them, join them. So I decide, uh, instead of me being outraged at what happened at losing my job, I would like the people on CNBC to be outraged. How can we piss them off? Uh, let's do crazy stuff, right? So we start growing this thing with the hopes that eventually we would, we would, 
make enough noise that people would complain, people meaning the institutional financial system, and then the, the government or, le- or regulation, the regulators would come in and say, hey, you know, come on, kids, stop it. This is not a toy. Um, and then I could have said, well, that's what you said last time. Um, to my surprise, uh, it's grown a lot more than I thought it would. It's accomplished a lot more than I thought. I've, I've been able, I've surpassed my original goals by a lot. Uh, what's interesting is that the moment that came, when we had the moment to finally have outrage, right? People on Bloomberg are sitting there looking at GameStop. What happened with GameStop, obviously, is, is probably the, the reason why um, people found out about Wall Street Bets that might not otherwise uh, have found it prior to that for pulling very crazy shenanigans. In fact, they were tweaking the formula for what they Is did. there a big shenanigan we've never heard of? Um, so here's one that, that you probably haven't heard of. So some people figured out, one guy in particular figured out how, let's just call it, get an infinite buying power <laughs> on their brokerage. They click stuff, right? They deposit money, they found a loophole, and they said, if you click this enough times, uh, the, the amount of money in my account continues to be whatever, $2,000, $5,000, but my buying power is now bigger. And if I keep clicking it, it keeps getting bigger. I can get into the details, but, uh, but the important part is there. He posts this online. Other people are like, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, I wonder how big I can get it to. So you have these people that are making these $2,000 deposits in an account, inflating it to like over a million or close to $2 million dollars and then taking that one or two million dollars and yoloing it right these are taking these ridiculously like uh, risky bets that are most likely going to lose but if they make they would make hundreds of millions of dollars right uh and and the logic that they're using at that time is well the banks were too big to fail i'm too small to collect from good luck getting two million bucks for me i don't have it right and that's the interesting question is about what does this mean about the culture? There's, I mean, would there be people who wanted to make Wall Street bets in the 80s, the 60s? I mean, obviously we didn't have the internet then, but what does it say about the culture besides just the internet? It's a couple of things, right? I think the mindset of the demographic of Wall Street bets is definitely a, a big factor. It was with me, meaning younger generations that did not have or don't have the same opportunities as previous ones. The American dream of just going to school and going, getting your degree in college, if that's, you know, that, that itself is, is now questioned these days, but then getting your good job with the benefits and then getting your house and, and, and letting that be your biggest investment and blah, blah. Um, that wasn't there. You have people that were losing their jobs or leaving college with huge debt and not have the ability to pay it because they're not, they're not getting jobs or they're getting jobs that don't pay as well. And they're living with their parents. They're getting married later. They're having fewer kids or they're ha- and or having them later. Uh, and they're having to start to hustle, right? To look out, to fend for themselves. And so that's where that mentality, and I definitely had it when I have my job at the institution that pays well as I was supposed to do. But I'm still thinking to myself, yeah, and I'm not falling for that again. I'm going to watch out for myself, right? Uh, you see that with the gig economy. People are like, oh, just take a gig, you know, being an influencer, writing, driving an Uber or whatever, um, and, and hustling, watching out, and becoming more independent and, and, and caring less or depending less on uh, the situation around you. And so that, that is a huge factor. I, I would say that's the most common denominator about the attraction to Wall Street bets. The Internet allows connections, the communication. Uh, you have the unap- unapologetic honesty of Wall Street bets, which allows it to be a real thing. People ask me, why do they post losses on Wall Street? Why would you ever do that? It's embarrassing. It's whatever. And, and, it's, and the answer is like, well, it's because it's what makes Wall Street bets. Uh, you, do, you go there on Christmas, there's still a lot of activity, but they're not talking about the stock market because it's closed and there's not very much going on there anyways. They're talking about their personal life, their family life. You know, they're, 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 it's like it's a real. therapy session, and so people, the connections are real, yeah. even if they're not in person. And so you have those two things: the people, the demographics, the mindset, the the the, the attitudes, uh, the distrust, and yeah, the distrust and the anger. People would say, "Oh, it's even angry or a come and get me kind of thing." I mean, is that is that a generational thing, or is that a is that happening? What's happening in the Western world? How do you explain that? It's a, it's a distrust. Uh, it's it's less to do with I don't trust you. Sometimes it might be, but it's more to do with I choose not to trust anybody. Right? I'm going to to watch out for myself, and even if it's in my best interest, I'd rather make money than to be right or to win an argument. And that philosophy is 
uh, is one of the things that actually sets aside Wall Street Bakers because they don't toot to the same horn as whatever else is going on in the world. The stocks start crashing during the pandemic and Wall Street Bets turns around and says, well, we got nothing to do, we got our checks and we don't have jobs or maybe, you know, like work at home. Let's figure out how to make money from this. Let's short the market and let's make memes about it. And then let's, you know, let's make joke or light about this terrible situation, right? And then they start making a ton of money because when stocks fall, they fall faster than they go up. And they're taking these leveraged bets with options, which pay off better when, when you have these big moves uh, or these fast moves. And they're making so much money that they're guilty. They straight up like, dude, I know we're laughing about the end of the world, but it's not funny. Like, how can we, it's bad for karma, let's, let's donate. So you have all these charity drives. They're literally right. donating money to, to whatever causes because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they, they might put on this farce of being these tough guys in the locker room, girls, and it's just. It's not how, that's how it is with everybody, right? It, you know, it's, that's exactly yeah. right, yeah. And, and then at the end of the day, it's all right, now we feel better. Okay, cool, stock crashes over, let's buy. Stocks only go up, let's make jokes about that. Is it, is it about, as, as someone once told me, is it about more about mastery and about poking your, your uh, finger in the, in, into the eye of the system rather than actually becoming rich quick? Yes and no. Uh, can't beat them, join them, continues to be a philosophy, right? So that the, sometimes poking in the eye implies wanting to win an argument or being morally or, or otherwise right. Uh, but it might also mean you don't make money. So the 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 morals or the ethics on Wall Street bets is nimble, right? Like it, it, they can say the stocks only go up and then the next they're like, let's short it or short sellers suck. But then, you know, like, uh, but on the other hand, you have the tribal component, which is as far as I can tell, a thing of life. Uh, you have sports teams, and you got the Bears, and you got the Packers, and you just hate each other, right? Or in Mexico, you got the different soccer teams where you just refuse to put on the thing. Politics, obviously, you know, you have the two teams, and, and, and they're just constantly just going at it with each other. You have, you know, you know if you have other sporting, you know, like people like to pretend, even if there's not necessarily an adversary, they like to pertain to a group, and they like to have the good guy and the bad guy, and, and that, uh, sportsmanship, that that uh, rivalry, the competitiveness, something about that, it, it, it strengthens the belonging uh, and it strengthens, strengthens common causes. And so I think that happens in life as, as a whole. And having the system to poke an eye at to it, identifying, okay, well, we're this team, who's on the other side of the team? Well, let's just call it them. Um, call it institutional uh, finance, uh, investment banks, whatever it might be. Uh, the central bank, and let's let's uh, make them the people that we need to be or and join in order to, to surpass them. Uh, I think it makes it more fun. What does make a, a meme stock? Uh, the people that choose it. <laughs> now you have look. That's that's actually uh, the, nobody in particular decides what the criteria is uh, from. Uh, the inception of Wall Street bets, there's been all sorts of different stocks that get picked. Eventually, they just kind of uh, uh, through the democracy of the internet, through the, the up those through the attention, uh, they get selected. But there's a common, so I don't know. But the common denominator between them, meaning if I were to say this one looks nothing like that one and that one, they do have some things in common, which are usually the company that's behind the stocks uh, is a company that is tangible. To or to, to to the people, to the you know, to the investors, traders, Wall Street. They sell players. video games, for example. I they sell video games. I like video games. Right. They sell cars, electric cars. I have or it's want. It's like a Peter Lynch school of investing, like old school, like buy what you know. That's exactly right, right? And also buy something so that you can then nurture, right? <clears throat> you, once you once you buy an investment, anybody, whether they're on Wall Street Bets or elsewhere, you have this kind of a. a confirmation bias is this uh, tendency to say, I'm only going to look for stuff that's going to make me feel better about my situation or my position, such as I bought this stock and now I'm gonna read all the good news about what this stock is company's been doing. It makes you feel better and then you can share it and then you can uh, poke fun. So that, hand, that, that personal connection is important. And then another one is it should have uh, relatively good options, like the, the liquidity, it has to be popular enough so that they can maneuver uh, with some of the crazier things that they do. So basically that means lots of 
volume uh, for the most part. And on the average, the the, price, the the stocks that have a lower price per share, not the not the the cost of uh, or the price of the investment because that's tricky. But the price per share, how much is one share going to take out of my pocket? If it's lower, it's better. And that that also deals with the, the derivatives that they like to work with. Um, uh, in spite of fractional shares, because I figured maybe fractional shares would eat into that concept, but um, uh, it didn't. So, lastly, what's your advice for uh, folks who are on Wall Street bets? I mean, should they make a bet and come to Mexico or go somewhere else where they can reduce? A lot of people are working remotely these days. Uh, should they be following your footsteps and and cutting their cost of living to have more money to buy? I think Americans are the people that are, well, I, I guess I can't speak for anyone, everyone, maybe the Europeans might not be the same, but I know that in the U.S. they're certainly more prepared to move around than they are in the rest of this continent. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? I lived coast to coast, north to south. I have now inhabited the entire country, you know, for, for the most part. Uh, and every time I have to go to a new place and I have to meet new people and figure out how to get to the new store and figure out, you know, what the rules of that new location are. And I've found it to be refreshing every time I make that change and I've become good at it. But I'm not alone in that. All of my friends that I went to high school with went to college and then the college they went to a different place and they got a job elsewhere. And so my friends are spread around the country and they also move around and they also have been very familiar with change. Making the move from the U.S. to Mexico is not very different. Uh, yeah. Maybe the language, maybe, but even still you can get away with it, than moving from the north to the south Absolutely or not. east to the west. The only place in the world I, I can get my Dr. Pepper. <laughs> my there I you go. That's right. It yes. It, it certainly so is. It's worthwhile, perhaps, because you have, your money can go so much further. It, yeah, yeah, well, one hundred percent. So you know, get past the idea of, well, that's a foreign place. I don't know right. things that are foreign. You do know things that are foreign because you've done it a ton of times in your life, and it's no different. If you move from from Los Angeles to Texas, that's not really that might be the language. That's about it. Yeah, but if you move from, let's say, San Francisco to like. Nebraska, all right, you, your cost of living is also going to go down. You will be able to feel the, the financial benefits of that. Uh, your lifestyle is going to change because the speed of life in, you know, an urban setting is different than a rural setting. And, and or maybe Wyoming would be a nice place for that. Um, but uh, you, you're going to you're going to feel the benefits. And a lot of people, I think, are doing that within the U.S., especially now that you can work remotely. Like it's such a huge benefit. There's also tax incentive. If you are a Mexican that resides, sorry, an American that resides outside the country and you make a ton of money, um, you do still need to pay U.S. if you continue, if you retain your U.S. citizenship. Uh, but there's breaks. They give you breaks and they give you a lot of ways. They're, they're um, uh, harder as an investor than an entrepreneur, but but there's yeah. It is harder as an investor, but look, you find ways to do it. Like when the people ask me, "What stocks do you buy?" I'm like, I no longer buy stocks. A pain in the ass. Like I have, I have them. I have my investments that are nice, dividend collecting, diversified ETF. But I don't play around there. I play around here because there's a whole set of things that have opened up to my world that are available in Mexico that are not available in the U.S. By living outside. La lastly, uh, you mentioned Nebraska. Thoughts on Warren Buffett and his school? Obviously, much different than Wall Street bets. I mean, the man is right. You can have two schools of thought that are correct, and so the goals that he has uh, are different. Uh, his 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 methodology of accomplishing the goals that are different to mine is the correct one. The, the, the man is an investor. He finds undervalued companies and he holds on to them thick or thin and he cuts his losses because he does also take losses, uh, notably the airlines recently. But uh, for the most part, he's very good and there's nothing wrong with trying to copy him if you're trying to be like him and if you want to do what he did, which is to build wealth. Get rich quick, you can do it. It's probability, it's luck, it's fun. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. You know, wealth creation, wealth building is, is a slower, more patient game. And it's very advisable for people that, uh, that have moved past the stage of let's have fun and to the stage of let's be serious. Will you still be here at 92? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that, um, well, I'll, I'll definitely still be here, and I think that I will be closer to the Warren Buffett style of investing, but it's going to be really hard to shake off the gamified approach to the stock market. You can always have your fun account, 
And then, and then you can use that for your speculative opportunities, which when they present themselves are killer, like when oil prices go negative. Jamie McIntyre, thank you so much. Thank you very much Pleasure. for having me.